We are back with our World History Online Lectures. For the past several days, we have been focusing on various aspects of the Italian Renaissance. So today we are going to switch our focus and talk about the spread of the Renaissance to the north. Here are the questions you need to be able to answer by the end of the video. The first is, what factors contributed to the spread of the Renaissance? And the second is, how did the Northern Renaissance differ from the Italian Renaissance? So beginning in the late 1400s, the major ideas and influences of the Renaissance spread beyond Italy's borders and to other parts of Europe. This spread of the Renaissance can be directly attributed to the strong trading industry that was earlier established in Italy. So by looking at the map, you can see how Europe became interconnected during this time period via the land and sea trade networks, which allowed for humanist ideas to spread rapidly throughout the continent. Also in 1450, Johann Gutenberg invented a machine called the printing press, which created the first form of mass media. Books and pamphlets and other reading materials became more accessible to many people, which aided in the spreading of humanist ideas. Gutenberg's printing press is one of the most important and influential inventions of the modern age. As I already said before, it allowed for the mass production of books, so in other words, it made the bookmaking process much quicker and more efficient. Before the printing press, books were very expensive and labor intensive to make. Skilled craftsmen would spend months and months just to make one single book. But after the printing press, books were made easier and quicker and cheaper. So this made it easier for people to have more access to knowledge and the means to become educated. So we're going to see an increase in the amount of education that the everyday common person had. The printing revolution is really going to influence several important periods of history, such as the Protestant Reformation, and it also leads the way into the Industrial Revolution, which shaped the world we live in today. You guys also might be very familiar with one of the first books to be mass-produced on Gutenberg's printing press. It was indeed the Bible. And if you happen to have one of these extremely rare Gutenberg Bibles lying around your house, you might want to think about selling it, because if you did, you can make a cool 25 million. So as humanist ideas were spreading throughout Europe with the aid of the printing press, the Renaissance in the North is going to take on its own identity that was separate from the Italian Renaissance. For example, instead of Florence being the epicenter of creativity, the majority of Northern Renaissance art blossomed in Flanders. Nope, not that Flanders, but this Flanders, which used to be the Northern region of Belgium. Also, there was a significant lack of classicism in the Northern Renaissance, and this is because it was nearly impossible for Northern Renaissance artists, poets, and architects to embrace the daily inspiration of Rome. They couldn't simply walk out into the streets and be awed by the magnificent ruins that were scattered throughout Italy. So instead, they pulled their inspiration from their own environments and everyday lives. Their art tended to focus more on beautiful landscapes in the natural world, such as animals. And also, Northern Renaissance art tended to be less provocative, more conservative, and pious. Northern Renaissance artists were not nearly as fascinated with perfecting the human form, but instead they focused on exquisite detail throughout the entirety of their compositions. Let's take a look at several pieces of Northern Renaissance art so you can observe some of these characteristics. First up is a painting by Albrecht Dürer, who is often called the Leonardo of the North. Here's his piece titled Young Hair. The precision and visual accuracy of this piece makes it look like the hair is about to hop right off the canvas. Another stunning piece by Dürer is his rhinoceros. And this is not a painting, but instead a woodcut, meaning that the image was actually carved into a block of wood by the artist. And if that wasn't impressive enough, Dürer had actually never seen a rhinoceros before making this piece. He based his engraving on written observations of other people. And although this piece is somewhat inaccurate, as rhinos don't really have plates of armor as their skin, the people of Northern Europe really put a lot of faith in the accuracy of this piece, and they believed this is actually what rhinos looked like until they were corrected in about the 18th century. So these pieces by Dürer really highlight the elements of the natural world that was really seen in the Northern Renaissance. 
This is a Flemish artist Van Eyck's painting titled The Arnolfini Wedding. This is one of his most famous pieces for several reasons. The painting is riddled with Christian symbolism and is a shining example of the piety or the religiousness of the Northern Renaissance. The amount of detail in this piece is also quite significant. If you focus your gaze to the back mirror, I'll blow it up so we can look at it more closely. You'll note that Van Eyck has actually painted the reflection of the subjects in the mirror itself. Also along the border of the mirror, there are individual scenes painted from the Bible. So when you look at it from far away, it doesn't look like much, but when you blow it up, the amount of detail is quite extraordinary. You'll also note that this amount of detail is seen throughout the entirety of the canvas and not just in the foreground or the background. Along with the evolution of art, language and literature was also advancing in the North. In England, a man named William Shakespeare, you might have heard of him, was starting to gain the attention of King Henry VIII and eventually his daughter, Queen Elizabeth I. Shakespeare's writing focused on the human condition and the experiences of human emotion. And this is something that all people could relate to, no matter their socioeconomic status. Over the course of his career, he wrote 153 love sonnets, around 30 plays, some of them tragedies, comedies, and histories. And he also introduced over 1,000 words and common phrases to the English language. And a lot of the language and phrases we use today we actually owe to Shakespeare, but you might not realize it. So phrases like, knock knock who's there, fight fire with fire, love is blind, a sorry sight, wear your heart on your sleeve. Okay, so all of these sayings we actually owe to Shakespeare. Beyond his literary contributions, a lot of movies that we watch today also have a Shakespearean influence. For example, She's the Man is simply a recreation of Twelfth Night, and Lion King is based off of Hamlet. So I think we all owe Will a big thanks. As you reflect on all of the creative contributions of the Renaissance, both the Italian and the Northern Renaissance in the form of art and architecture and literature, you might be struck with just how talented these people were back during this time period. And it's because these people were all striving to become the ultimate Renaissance man. It wasn't enough to simply be a good sculptor. Instead, a lot of these creatives wanted to be masters of many things. They wanted to be praised by God through their artistic accomplishments. Therefore, it was necessary for them to master sculpting and inventing, painting and architecture, to understand many languages and philosophy, and to be able to express themselves through poetry. I often wonder if the concept of a Renaissance man still exists in our society today. What do you think? Try to come with an answer to that question for tomorrow. For now, don't forget to take the quiz, and I'll see you tomorrow in class.